Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldElder.com. I'm Brent, and in this video I'll be talking about running Eldari Combat Patrols in 10th edition Warhammer 40k. I'll start by talking about what Combat Patrol play is, how it's changed from previous editions, and then I'll move on to discussing the Eldari Combat Patrol, how to approach the handful of choices that one makes when one puts it on the table, and then how to think about playing it tactically in the most effective ways. So let's start with what a combat patrol game is. Combat patrol play is the simplest, most user-friendly, cheapest way to get into the hobby. Combat patrol games, first of all, are 500 points. Uh, every model on the table has a point value. If you're really new to 40K, you may not know this. And a typical game of 40K involves both players having 2,000 points of models on the table. So first off, a 500-point game has one quarter the number of models and units or units on the table that a, a normal game of 40k would have. And in addition, the rules are slightly simplified. Because in 10th edition, combat patrol play is focused very narrowly on players who are new to the game or at least new to the faction that they're running. It gives players the opportunity to get their heads around a lot of the core concepts and, and get comfort with the progression of phases in a turn and, and the core rules and the, how maybe how this particular army plays without having to worry about the additional complexities of list constructions and complex stratagem choices and uh, complex secondary scoring and so on. So unlike in previous editions of 40k in which the rules for combat patrol games were the same as for larger games, you just were using fewer models, this really is a streamlined slightly different version of 40k and by the way i love it i think that it is wonderful that gw has done this it significantly lowered the barrier to entry it is far and away the best way to learn not just uh the game but also the addition if you're just new to the addition this is a great place to start for one thing it's just a lot more practically accessible uh you only need half the play area, so you only need half the terrain that you do for a regular 2,000-point game of 40k. And you can get into combat patrol play for only 150 American dollars, because that is the cost of the combat patrol for each faction in the game. So here's one of the single biggest differences. I would go so far as to say arguably the biggest difference between combat patrol play and the main game is that in in Warhammer 40k, normal games, 1,000 or 2,000 point games, a big part of the game is list construction. Each faction has all of these different unit options and players customize uh, what's going into their particular list, their particular army that they're bringing to the table. And although that's a lot of the fun of the hobby is list building, it's also enormously complex. And in combat patrol games, there really is no list building. There is a preset combat patrol for every faction in the game that comes in that $150 box set. And if you buy that and assemble it, you are ready to go. And we're only running those combat patrols against other people who are running a combat patrol box. And so theoretically, all of these preset lists that GW has produced in these $150 box sets are all fairly balanced against one another. And this gives new players an opportunity to play not only one another, but also veteran players with some sort of reasonable guarantee that the lists have equal chances of beating one another. So if if you get stomped, it's not because you, you didn't know what was good or because your, your opponent's army is just sort of in principle unbeatable by what you brought to the table, which is a thing that can happen in the regular 40k game, but instead probably because uh, you, you, got, you got outplayed and that's a, that's, a, that's a more fun way to lose because then all the way home from your game, you can be thinking about like, ah, if only I had prioritized destroying that unit instead of seizing that objective on turn two, I, I, could have, I could have changed the whole outcome or whatever. There are a few minor list building decisions that go into this, uh, which I'll talk about when I start talking about the, the Eldar, just so these combat patrols feel a little bit personalized. But that has to do with like the special ability you give your warlord and whether you want to run... Uh, if you have six jet bikes, for example, whether it's going to be one six bike squad or two three bike squads, but you're playing with the same models no matter what and the same overall loadouts for the most part. The other way in which combat patrol play differs from the main 40k game is that the, the missions are different. 
the core rules are the same. So the mechanics for moving and shooting and wounding, they're all the same. And so if you're playing combat patrol 40K to learn 40K, all of those rules that you are learning will still be relevant when you do the main game. But the mission rules for combat patrol is, is, are different, right? And so the mission rules, that refers to where the deployment zones are on the table, where the objective markers go. If you're really new to the hobby, you might not understand the concept of objective markers. Objective markers are locations on the table that you need to control in order to score victory points. You win 40K, not by eliminating your opponent's army. You can win that way, but generally games of 40K are decided uh, not by who has no models left, but by who has scored the most victory points. And those are scored predominantly by controlling certain points on the table, by having models on or near those points. And then there's also some special rule for the mission. Uh, this is just some sort of fun flavor detail that rarely has big, meaningful tactical implications. When you're playing a, a regular 2000 point game of 40K or even a 1000 point game of 40K, uh, th those rules, those mission rules are determined with something called the Leviathan mission deck. And you, you draw cards that tell you what deployment zones you'll use and what the special rule will be and how primary missions are scored. And so theoretically, it's kind of the same, but the combat patrol ones, they're just simpler. They're more straightforward. It's very easy to get your head around. And even though theoretically there are six different ways to score primary objectives, they all basically amount to you get five points for each objective that you control at the end of your turn. And in some missions, you can score the one in your own deployment zone and in some missions that you can't. There's a little more to it than that, but, but not really. Now, the other two significant ways in which the rules are a bit different uh, are that secondary objectives are much, much simpler in combat patrol play. So in normal 40K, you can score 100 victory points, 10, 10 of which you get for just having a painted army. And then you can get up to 50 victory points for scoring those primary objectives, for controlling those points on the table, and up to 40 victory points for secondary objectives, which are either fixed goals that you, you choose before the game involving eliminating particular types of units in your opponent's list or having your models in particular places on the table that aren't necessarily on objectives. Or sometimes it's about doing actions, which practically means you're going to have a unit that doesn't shoot, doesn't charge, doesn't fight. And instead, we imagine that they're just doing a thing. And those, those rules can actually get pretty tactically complex and it's a lot to keep track of. So instead, in combat patrol play, each individual faction, so each of those predetermined combat patrols, uh, there is an orc combat patrol, there is one option for orc players, there is an Eldari combat patrol, there's one option for Eldari players, comes with two secondary objective options. You choose one before the game and generally speaking, these can't score you more than 10 to 15 points. So in combat patrol play, the vast majority of the scorable points will be determined by those primary objectives. And then the secondary objective thing is like, it's a little depth and flavor. And if the game is close, it's going to be decided by secondary objectives. But probably a lot of the time, unless the game is in fact quite close, it won't be decided by secondary objectives. It will be decided by uh, primary objectives. So you, you get to you get to focus on just holding the points on the table and you don't have to worry as much about this other stuff. It's not that it doesn't matter, but it's just not as big a deal tactically. The other way in which uh, combat patrol play is quite different is that uh, each of those combat patrols, if you, were, if you were running an army in regular 40K, your army would come with its general army ability that uh, all detachments from that army will always get. And then you'd get some special detachment bonus on top of those big like faction wide bonuses. And then in addition, you have six stratagems in the regular 40 K game. There are different, you can, you can choose detachment rules. You can choose it like an extra bonus for your whole army. Now, currently most armies don't have codexes. They just have the index, which is out. And in the index, each army has access only to a single detachment bonus. But armies that have gotten a codex, like the Tyranid one just came out, they choose between several different detachment bonuses, which also determines which stratagems they can use. It all becomes very complicated. But in combat patrol play, there are no detachment bonuses. And there are only three stratagems for each faction, and they're generally quite simple. So that's 
10th edition combat patrol play in a nutshell in terms of how it's different from the main game i think you're unlikely to play more than six to ten games of combat patrol play because i think once you do you'll have a good enough handle on the rules that it will be exciting to you to start doing list construction and you will be able to handle having additional stratagems and you you, you will want to start playing with other models and that's fine that's good i think that gw has correctly identified that the the primary role of combat patrol games in the the ecosystem of warhammer 40k is as a as a gateway and there's certainly nothing to stop you veteran players who only have uh an hour to play a game from running 500 point games using the 1000 point rules okay so let's talk about the eldari combat patrol uh what it is and how to use it the preset Eldari Combat Patrol list is called the Fate Breakers, and it includes a, a named Farseer, Eraneth, who is like a regular Farseer, except he doesn't have one of the abilities that a regular Farseer has. I'll get to that later. Uh, ten Guardian Defenders with a support platform that has a star cannon on it. They are otherwise standard Guardian Defenders. Six Wind Riders two of which have scatter lasers, four of which have twin-linked shark and catapults. And here's one of the few decisions you can make. You can decide whether your wind riders run as a single squad of six or two squads of three. And I'm going to tell you right now, you want to run them as two squads of three. And when you do so, each squad must have a single scatter laser and two bikes with the twin-linked cannons. And then a wraith lord, ooh. Uh, but he's a toned down Wraith Lord. He only has one shoulder mounted weapon instead of two. And he doesn't have any of the abilities that the Wraith Lord. Oh, he's got the, he has the glaive, the big ghost glaive. That thing's cool. Uh, and he doesn't have any of the abilities that the, the Wraith Lord in the Codex has, the index, I should say. Most importantly, he doesn't have strands of fate, which the first time I recorded this video, I did not notice. And uh, so I'm remaking the video. And that is a point. If you are a veteran player and you are accustomed to your standard index rules, if you are going to play a combat patrol game with somebody and, and you're running a patrol for, from any faction, not just craft worlds, you need to read the data cards and the rules very, very carefully because it can be easy to overlook the differences. Now, when you are assembling your Eldari combat patrol before a game, there are exactly three choices that you get to make. These are the models that you have. You can't really change their loadouts. You can decide whether or not those jet bikes are a squad of six or two squads of three. I've already said you should, for reasons we will get to, you want to run them as two squads of three. Uh, the two other choices you make both have to do with the Farseer. So you can decide, do you want the Farseer to lead the, the squad of guardians or not? If he leads the, scard of, the squad of guardians, then nobody can target him until all of the guardians are dead. So it gives him some protection there's another potential benefit, which I'll get to in a moment when I talk about enhancements. The reason to run him not with the squadron of guardians is so that you can have the guardians being a little bit more aggressive, doing something dangerous. You can put them in a position where they are not unlikely to be killed without risking losing your farce here. You could, you could keep him back and out of line of sight. Now, unlike the, the jet bike decision, I think that, uh, both of these moves are totally arguable. It really comes down to how, how you want to play with the Guardians. I will say that if, you, if you're playing against somebody who has really fast units or any kind of indirect fire, uh, you definitely want your Guardian or your uh, Farseer to be part of the, the Guardian squad because you, you want those ablative wounds to keep him alive. He has, he has an ability that's pretty important, but it's, but it's, not, it's not necessary. Uh, the other choice that you need to make is which enhancement to give your, your warlord. And, and they've done this with all of the factions in the game. Players get to make two or three lists before the, the decisions before the game begins. So there is this sense that the, the combat patrol is in some way personalized. And also you get a little bit of practice with the, just the concept of making tactical list building decisions before the game starts without having to really do it. Uh, so in regular 40K you can give your characters enhancements and there are a bunch of enhancements to choose from and, and some lists might include a, a, several uh in combat patrol play in, oh and in regular 40k you pay points for enhancements in combat patrol play there are two options you choose one and there's only one character you can put it on so you can either give farseer araneth foresight which is the default one 
Uh, once per turn, you can target the bearer's unit with the fire overwatch stratagem for zero CP. And if the bearer's unit is within range of an objective marker, you control hits are scored on unmodified hit rolls of four plus while resolving that stratagem. Otherwise, hits are scored on an unmodified hit roll of five plus while using this stratagem. So this requires me to explain what Overwatch is. Overwatch is a generic stratagem in the core book that any army can, can use. You pay one command point. The way command points work is that you get one at the beginning of your turn and one at the beginning of your opponent's turn. You don't get any just at the beginning of the game and you, you spend those command points to use your stratagems. In regular 40K, there are some ways to like get additional ones. But for your purposes for combat patrol play, uh, you're going to get two per battle round. And Overwatch is a stratagem that lets you interrupt your opponent's turn either in your opponent's movement phase at the end of your opponent's movement phase or in your opponent's charge phase and suddenly shoot with a unit as though it were your shooting phase. Now, uh, you need in order to do this, you need to be within 24 inches of the unit that you're shooting, uh, that unit needs to have moved if it's the movement phase or declared a charge if it's the charge phase and you have to have line of sight. Uh, and unlike in the shooting phase, instead of hitting on whatever your ballistic skill says you would hit on, you only hit on sixes. In regular 40K, this can be a very powerful tool for uh, shooting an enemy tank with something called like, with like a bright lance and then using your fate dice which I'll talk about later to automatically hit. But most of the time, uh, your Overwatch fire will be significantly less effective than your regular fire, again, because you only hit on sixes. But Aranith's ability, the, the Psychic Foresight ability, instead of hitting on sixes, you hit on fives, which may not sound like a big improvement to you newer players, but it actually is. Hitting one in three times instead of one in six times is pretty considerable. And then if you're on an objective, you hit on fours, which is also pretty cool. Now, if the Farseer is leading the Guardians, obviously you will shoot many more times if you choose this, but he also has a pretty good shooting attack just on his own. He has this shooting attack Eldritch Storm with a 24 inch range, so that's overwatch range. It does d6 attacks. It hits on threes. It's strength six, which means it's going to wound anything that's uh, toughness four or five on, on a three. And if something's toughness three, it'll wound it on a two. Minus two AP, D3 damage is pretty good. And it's blast, which means if you target an enemy unit that has uh, five or more models, for every five or more models in the unit, every chunk of five, it does plus one attack. So even against a standard squad of like five space Marines, it would be D6 plus one shots. Now, in, in the regular 40k game, the Eldritch Storm is not, it's not that big a deal. It's not that important a tool. It's, it's pretty good, but you have a lot of more powerful tools. But in this 500-point combat patrol with relatively few models on the table, Eldritch Storm is actually really powerful. And so you could, on your opponent's turn, interrupt their movement phase and blast a unit with Eldritch Storm if uh, your Farseer can see the unit and do some serious damage uh, by using fate dice. Now, that, that is a mechanic I will talk about shortly when I talk about army rules. But the, the reason to choose this enhancement is to significantly increase your fire output by having your, your Farseer's unit potentially shoot twice per turn instead of once per turn, presuming it has line of sight. Now, your other option is called Eldritch Might, and this just makes the Farseer's shooting attack better. Each time the bearer makes a psychic attack, reroll a hit roll of one, reroll a wound roll of one, and reroll a damage roll of one. All of those are good. It is especially good for the damage roll because that D3 damage is now going to be doing two or three damage the vast majority of the time, which is an, an extremely powerful tool against heavy infantry. Uh, heavy infantry, I generally think of as any infantry with two wounds. And uh, there isn't anything else in your list that's highly efficient against stuff with two wounds, except for the, the Ghost Glaive on the Wraith Lord, and that has to be in melee to be effective. I think both of these are really good. I think Eldritch Might is the is the better pick for a an inexperienced player uh, 
simply because it doesn't require you. In order to use the Overwatch ability, you have to have your Farseer and maybe also the Guardians if he's part of that unit. And I think if you're going to use that one, he pretty much has to be part of the unit. Hanging out in the open in order to have line of sight on an, an enemy, uh, or, or at least in a position where when your enemy moves into the midfield, they will they will then have line of sight on the enemy and and they're pretty fragile so if you're going to be using that uh foresight ability yeah you you might potentially get to shoot your enemy before they they shoot you but then they do shoot you and it's it's pretty hard to keep those fragile space elves alive if you are going to take uh the foresight ability and rely on that overwatch trick the way to do it is to a make sure that your guardians are in cover so that is if they are in a piece of terrain or some of the models in the unit are behind a piece of terrain uh, then you get plus one to your armor save when your opponent targets the unit taking their armor save to a three plus and then to additionally use uh, the farseer's ability fortune on them which you, you know you roll a d6 in your command phase and on a two up the whole unit becomes minus one to wound this means that most infantry weapons most anti-infantry weapons that would normally wound those guardians on a three most anti-infantry weapons are at least strength four maybe on a four there are some things in the game that are strength three uh, will instead be wounding them on fours or even fives and if they if they have a cover save even against something with minus one ap they're still going to save on a four up. So if you if you throw uh, if you put them in cover and you throw fortune on the unit against the sorts of weapons that are generally optimal against killing infantry, uh, your opponent will be hitting on whatever they hit on, probably threes, uh, wounding on fours, and then you'll be saving on fours if there's minus one AP, maybe even on threes. There's actually a way to also make them minus one to hit using a stratagem with CP. So if you do decide you want to take the overwatch stratagem there are a bunch of moving parts you, you have to make sure they're in cover uh you use the farseer's ability to make them harder to wound and then there's a stratagem you can use when i talk about the stratagems i'll go over it uh to make them minus one to hit and you kind of have to be doing all of those things and then uh also spend some fate dice on probably the farseer's overwatch attack and if you're going to play it that way the overwatch enhancement's pretty good you lure your opponent into the midfield you shoot them before they can shoot you and if you target like the one infantry unit that would have been good against the guardians maybe then it's difficult for them to retaliate effectively against the guardians it's a way you can play it newer players might find it a lot easier to simply take the ability that makes the farseer's psychic attack uh hit more reliably and do more damage and if you're going to play it that way what you probably want to do is keep the farseer and perhaps the guardians totally safe in the first two turns of the game while the farseer puts uh fortune on some other unit probably the wraith lord and then once you've done some serious damage to the units in your opponent's list uh only then do you emerge with the farseer and the guardians uh their fragility becomes less of a problem once your opponent's list is compromised you do some real damage with them and generally this is how eldar are played in in warhammer certainly also in the main game you want to keep your head down and keep your models pretty safe and the first two turns while you rely on your ability uh to do devastating damage to thin out your opponent's list and only then do you emerge into the midfield and start trying to score points eldar are sort of famously speedy glass cannons so that's how they that's how they play you you keep your head down you don't expose yourself to fire uh you get an advantage by picking up some of your opponent's units more of your opponent's units than they can kill from your list and only then do you fully commit so that Eldritch Might ability, I think it's very straightforward. I think it's easy for new players. It requires fewer moving parts to make it effective. Okay, let's talk about Strands of Fate. So Strands of Fate is the army-wide special ability for Eldari. And it looks like it works the same in combat patrol play that it does in the regular 40k game, but it's actually a bit different. Here's how Strands of Fate works. You roll 12 dice before the game starts. And whatever you roll on those dice can then be substituted for rolls before you make them during the game for specific types of rolls. So you can use, you roll these 12 dice, and when whatever numbers they show on the die, that number can be substituted in for an advance roll, a battle shock test, a charge roll, a damage roll, a hit roll, a saving throw, 
or a wound roll, that's a very powerful ability. In regular 40k, it has been nerfed. If, if you were to look at the the rules as written when when Eldar dropped, it was the same, but the, the regular rules have been nerfed. So in regular 40k, Eldari players can only use one die per phase. So you could do once in the shooting phase, you could use one of these dice. However, the combat patrol rules for any individual faction stand apart from the regular rules. The data sheets for these units look a bit different. The stratagems are a bit different. So the strands of fate rules uh, still enable a player to use as many dice in combat patrol play as she wishes in an, in an individual phase of the game instead of being limited to one. And if you're at all unsure about this, in the 40k app, if you look at the strands of fate rules it, when you click on Index Eldari, it will tell you one per phase. If you look at the Strands of Fate rules in Combat Patrol Eldari, it will say nothing about one per phase. Uh, and that is because in Combat Patrol play, this is not broken. And the reason that it is not broken is that the units that you've been given are limited and don't include the units that were creating problems in the regular 40k game. I'm not going to waste your time by talking about that right now. But there were certain synergies with Strands of Fate that were just too good in regular 40k, and th those are not the units that you have in, in your list. The, the one unit that theoretically could create problems is the Wraith Lord, and that model doesn't have Strands of Fate in Combat Patrol play. It does in the regular 40k game. So it, in order to use the strands dice, the, the unit has to say strands of fate on the card. And every other unit in your combat patrol that's not the Wraith Lord says that. So you can't automatically do eight damage with the Bright Lance uh, by, by using a six on a damage roll. And it does D6 plus two. But what you can do, do you remember how I mentioned uh, the Farseer, if he's using that Overwatch ability, is potentially very powerful? If, if you get your... Uh, your, your Farseer and your Guardians such that one of those Guardians is touching an objective in your backfield and you, you string them out a little bit into a ruin so they have cover and they have line of sight into the midfield and your opponent moves into the midfield. Well, now when you trigger Overwatch fire, because you're touching an objective, that enhancement lets you hit with Overwatch on fours, not just on sixes. And you've got your, all of your Guardians are shooting two shots apiece. So that's 20 Shuriken fire shots plus your star cannon is shooting two shots and that thing hits really hard plus your farseer has his eldritch storm and you could potentially use a bunch of four pluses to just guarantee that on turn one you massacre one of your opponent's units with uh overwatch fire and that would be a that would be a good trick and a very classic space elf trick so strands of fate is very powerful it also enables you to automatically su succeed on saving throws and one of the reasons that you might be comfortable not attaching your Farseer to the Guardians, especially if he is going to go out on his own and you're going to take the other ability instead of the Overwatch ability, uh, is that he has a, a four plus invulnerable save, an unmodifiable saving throw. So you could use any four up saves dice that he has to just automatically su succeed on a saving throw against a hard hitting weapon, which is also pretty useful. There are a lot of good tricks here. Now, there's one other complexity uh, with the Fate Dice, and that is that you can choose before the game starts to, if you don't like your 12 di dice roll, if you, don't, if you don't like the numbers you're seeing, you can choose to re-roll them, but this time you only get 11 dice. And you can do it any, any number of times, but every time you re-roll them before the game begins, you have to give up a die to do it. Now, in regular 40k, rarely does it make sense to re-roll your dice for the reason that in regular 40k, Farseers have an ability that lets them, once per player turn, treat any die as a six. So all of your ones in regular 40k, functionally speaking, if you have a Farseer in your list, are probably sixes, which makes any roll pretty good. It's got to be a, a very bad roll indeed in order for you to want to re-roll your fate dice and give one up in, in, in regular 40k. There are numbers where it makes sense. But in combat patrol play, the Farseer doesn't have that ability. And so your ones are literally unusable. Your twos are very nearly unusable. There are very few situations. If you needed to make an advance move onto an objective and all you needed to get onto the objective was not roll a one, yes, you'd want to use a two. 
But in the course of a game, how many twos can you really use? Maybe one. So all your ones and twos are functionally pretty useless. If you roll more than four ones and twos before the game begins, you should re-roll the roll unless you rolled a statistically unlikely number of sixes. If, if you rolled uh, three or four sixes, maybe it's worth thinking about. But generally, if you, if you rolled more than four ones and twos before the game begins, you're better off re-rolling the dice and, having, and sacrificing a die. It's a good general guideline. But fate dice are going to play a little bit differently in combat patrol play simply because in regular 40k, usually you're using your, your fate dice in concert with these very hard hitting weapons, like a D cannon or a cannon on a fire prism. And th the hardest hitting weapon in your list in the combat patrol play is the bright lance on the Wraith Lord. And that thing, as I've already said, in combat patrol play can't use fate dice. So you are more likely to be doing something like using four or five fate dice to guarantee a particularly hard hit with a an, an overwatch attack with say the the star cannon and your farseer's eldritch storm ability than you are to play them the way that you would in uh in the regular game okay so let's look at the other data sheets and then we'll talk stratagems and and then we'll wrap up with a, a general overview of how these how these elves play uh so we've talked about the farseer uh, I started talking about the Guardians in terms of what it looks like when they're attached to the Farseer. They, they do have one other noteworthy ability, and that is that at the end of your command phase for each objective marker you control that has a unit of Guardians, within range of it, you roll a d6 and you add it to your fate dice. So they, they get you another fate die per turn, and that's good, right? The, the only... Here, here's how I would think of it. If you're not doing the thing... I think there are really two ways to play these guys. And one is to give the Farseer the Overwatch ability, put him in the Guardians, and do that thing I talked about before, where you like move into cover on turn one, and you plan to just open up on your opponent as soon as they move into the midfield and, and hopefully cripple them so that that squad can survive the, the punch back. I think, that's a, I think that's a solid move. If you're not doing that, your Guardians and your Farseer are keeping their head down for the first couple turns in the backfield, and... The Guardians, if they're doing this uh, and they're standing on an objective, they're still doing something for you. That is that they're getting you more um, fate dice. You have so few models available to you that you need to be able to bring the Guardians' uh, offensive force to bear, even though they're really not. In, in regular 40k, you would never think about Guardian Defenders as a meaningful combat unit. But in this, they are. Uh, those, those 20 Shuriken shots... That's actually pretty good anti-infantry fire at strength four with minus one AP. That's pretty solid. So either it's an overwatch unit that's going to punish stuff for moving into the midfield, or it's a late game unit that you're going to use for uh, mopping up your opponent and scoring objectives after the first two turns. They're also bodyguards for your Farseer potentially. Okay, the Windriders. So you, you can either have two squads of Windriders uh, or with three each, and each with a scatter laser and the, and the twin-linked catapults, or you can have the one with six. Now, the only reason that you would run them all as a squad of six is to maximize the benefit of buffs. So if you buff a unit, you obviously, if there are more models in the unit, you're, you're buffing more models. But the stratagems, most of the buffs available to you are going to be those three stratagems we haven't talked about yet. And the way the stratagems are phrased, I should have done the stratagems first, sorry. The way the stratagems are phrased, uh, if you have your, if you have two units of Windriders, the stratagem will affect both units so as not to punish you for breaking them. The one buff that the Windriders can benefit from if you run them as a single squad instead of two squads is the Farseer's Fortune ability, the minus one to wound. And minus one to wound on Windriders is really good because at toughness four, they're tougher than the Guardians. What that means is the anti-infantry stuff, like the, the standard guns that are carried around by infantry and bikers, uh, will only be wounding them on fives or maybe even sixes if stuff is strength three. Uh, so they become almost immune to stuff that's strength three. But there's not a whole lot of strength three shooting in combat patrol play. Uh, so they're only being wounded on fives by anti-infantry fire, which is good. Um, 
But really, I think that you're going to want to be using that fortune power either because you're doing the, the Overwatch trick I just talked about on the Guardians and the Farseer, or probably you're going to be throwing it on the Wraith Lord. It's an enormously powerful combo on the Wraith Lord. I'll talk about that when I get to the Wraith Lord. So there really isn't any, in, in terms of the, the maximizing the buffs, there isn't really a great reason not to just run it as two squads of three. And if you run it as two squads of three, your ability to take an objective without putting the entire squad in danger or uh, get into your opponent's backfield in order to score extra secondary points. I'll talk about that when I talk about our secondary stratagems. It, it's it's maximized. It's just better. Having a bunch of MSU units, minimum sized unit units, uh, enables you to bait your opponent into making trades. So and this is a tactic in regular 40k too, units that are cheap are also kind of disposable. And if, if you don't have the three elf unit units of Wind Riders, you really don't have a disposable unit. And in combat patrol play, you can't really afford to play with any units as though they're disposable. But if you have uh, if you have three bikes instead of six bikes, you have two units of three, you could with one of those units of bikes, for example, um, pop into your opponent's backfield to kill an undefended character and be okay with losing the bikes. Or if your opponent is trying to move a tank into the midfield, you could zip into their backfield and park the bikes like right in front of the tank and move block it. So on turn one, it can't get out from behind terrain to see anything and just trap it there for a turn while you, you deal with your opponent's other models. There are all sorts of tricks you have available if you have two units instead of one unit. And I think that that makes it... Uh, I, th I think that that gets us to a point where there's really no good reason to consider running the bikes as a six elf unit, unless you're going to do some durability trick with fortune. And I think there are better options for that. So the other advantage that the bikes have, they, they have pretty good shooting. So the, the, uh, the scatter laser fires six shots, strength six, long range, no AP. The no AP thing isn't great, but it's very effective, effective at picking up infantry. And then the twin linked catapults let you reroll the wound roll. So even though they're only strength four, they actually stand a pretty good chance of dinging anything that's less than toughness eight. It's slightly better than 50% chance. So they're, they're going to be pretty effective against all but the, the hardest targets. And they also have this swift demise ability. Uh, if you make a ranged attack against the tar the closest eligible target, you can reroll ones. And if that target isn't on objective, you just reroll the hit roll, uh, which significantly reduces the amount that they miss and makes their, uh, their fire really count. So that's some, that's some pretty, they're, they're firing each of those three elf squads is firing 10 shots. Six of those shots are strength six with no AP. Four of those shots are only strength four but re-rolling the wound roll because of the twin linked ability uh, with minus one AP, um, both of those are pretty pretty good sh anti-infantry shooting packages in a game uh, with only 500 points on the table. And again, even against stuff that's like light vehicles and very light tanks, stuff that's T6, T7, even that stuff you're going to be wounding on fives with the scatter lasers, fours at a six, or with the equivalent of a better than 50% chance with the catapults because of the reroll. So these are these are good units for killing enemy chaff, for moving around the table to grab hard to reach objectives, for blocking your opponent's movement. They're great tools. If these were chess, if this were if this was chess, think of these as your knights. Uh, they're effective trading pieces and they're also good at being tricky. Lastly, uh, your Wraith Lord. So your Wraith Lord is a, a bully unit. A bully unit in 40k is a big, tough, dangerous, hard to kill, usually monster that marches into the, the midfield and is a melee threat that both disincentivizes your opponent from challenging you in the, in the midfield and also gives you an answer to anything your opponent have that might be a fast uh, melee unit or a, or a bully unit of her own. The Wraith Lord carries the, the Bright Lance on the shoulder, which is the, the single most powerful shooting weapon in your army. This Wraith Lord is a bit um, toned down, as I said before. Uh, and you will notice that it is, among other things, it is the worst shot in your army, I guess, because it is a ghost. It is a ghost elf. It only hits on fours, but you could 
You could use a, a one CP reroll on that, I guess, if you really had to. Unfortunately, you can't cheat it with Fate Dice because it doesn't have it doesn't have that ability. Uh, so the Bright Lance hits on fours. It's strength twelve. It's minus three AP, and it does D six plus two damage. So that's a that's a big hit. But again, not being able to use your Fate Dice and having a fifty percent chance of missing makes it pretty unreliable. The better weapon that the the Wraith Lord is carrying is. The Ghost Glaive, this is the single hardest hitting, most dangerous thing in your list. It also only hits on fours, but it has lots of attacks. So the Ghost Glaive has two different profiles. It's got the Strike, strike Profile, four attacks, Strength 10, minus three AP, D6 plus one damage. So statistically, it's going to hit with two of those, but then it's going to wound most things uh, pretty reliably against something really tough like itself that's also T11. It would only be wounding on a five, and you couldn't cheat it. But minus three AP D6 plus one damage is really good. And then it has a sweep attack, which is anti-infantry, bikes, and heavy infantry. That's eight attacks, again, hitting on fours, strength seven. So still wounding most, like stuff like space marines on a three. Minus two AP, flat two damage, which will just auto kill like a space marine on every failed save. Uh, but it has some other advantages too. It's got a two up save. So against it, anti-infantry fire is just gonna pink off of it. It's toughness 11, which means only the, the only weapons that are really dangerous to it are going to be stuff like other Bright Lances and Lazcan and stuff that's strength 12 or better that's gonna wound it on a three up. And it has 10 wounds. And you can, if you throw uh, fortune on it, well, now it's toughness 11 and it's minus one to wound, which means pretty powerful heavy weapons that are like strength eight or nine are now only going to wound it on a six and even something like uh like a bright lance is another bright lance is only going to wound it on a four it's it, it's good you can you can make this thing scary and hard to remove it's the only unit in your list that you theoretically can move into the midfield early in the game and not worry about your opponent just killing it out of the gate if if you put fortune on it, I would still advise you to consider keeping your head down early because uh, space elves are, we, we are fragile. And you, you before you start getting aggressive and exposing your units to fire, you really do need to uh, thin out your opponent's list. So your Wraith Lord is your big tough bully unit. It shields your army from aggressive melee threats. It's a way to contest an objective in the midfield with that objective control three and not have to worry that your opponent's just going to kill the model. But it has, even though, even though it has powerful shooting, it also has, it's got some shuriken catapults on its wrists, but the Bright Lance is really the thing. It has some powerful shooting, but it's very unreliable shooting. And that's also somewhat true of the Ghost Glaive. Okay, let's talk um, stratagems. You have three unique Eldari stratagems in addition to being able to do things like Overwatch Fire and... Uh, what did we say before? Oh, the command reroll, where you spend a CP to reroll the die. The only other stratagem, main book stratagem, that I think you're, you're very likely to use is Insane Bravery, although this has been changed recently. And because it's in the core book and it's being changed in the core book, it, it's, it's also being changed for combat patrol play. Insane Bravery lets you uh, automatically pass for one CP a battle shock test, but you you now have to do it before you roll the dice. It used to be before, and you can only do it once per game. You'll, you're very likely to use that once over the course of a game. But then you have these three stratagems that are unique to your space elves. The first is with fast reactions. You use it in your opponent's shooting or fight phase just after an enemy unit has been has selected its targets one Eldari infantry or mounted unit that was selected as the target of those attacks uh, is now minus one to hit. You could theoretically spend two CP to use this twice, once in your opponent's shooting phase and once in your opponent's melee phase if you were also engaged in close combat. Uh, this cannot be used on the Wraith Lord to increase its durability because it's specifically infantry or mounted. So you can use it on bikes. If you are... I mentioned earlier, if you are doing that thing with the Guardians where you're going to try to use them as, a, as an Overwatch tool, uh, you definitely, they definitely need to be in cover. They definitely want fortune on them and you definitely want to use uh, with fast reactions on them. And then potentially they're pretty good. This is also the only stratagem that um, if you run the six bike squad, uh, 
the, the benefits of all six bikes instead of um, just three of them, the other stratagems you could use on, on two mounted units. This is great. You're going to use this almost every turn of the game. It's really powerful. Minus one to hit is so good. Most stuff in the game hits on threes. And if you can take that to a four, it ends up being a pretty significant statistical difference. Okay, the next one, Storm of Shots. You can do this on up to, it's one CP, up to two mounted units or one infantry unit. You use it in your shooting phase until the end of phase. Each time a model and one of those units makes an attack, add one to the hit roll. You can have your guardians hitting on twos. Uh, so if, if you move your guardians out into the open with the notion that you're going to interrupt your opponent's turn, you can have that whole squad, including the uh, platform that's shooting and the farseer with his storm attack you can have all of them hitting on twos and then in your opponent's turn before your opponent fires they'll do that whole thing again but now they're going to hit on fours with uh the enhancement this is also really good on your wind riders oh my goodness if both squads of wind riders are in a position to target enemy units uh you are literally cutting in half the frequency with which they miss which ends up being a significant uptick statistically in the damage at the end. So this is this is really good. Much like with fast reactions, it's really good. Uh, the last one though, Zephyr Swift, I think is going to be key. Uh, it's <laughs> this is this is fabulous. It's the it's the old elf fire and fade trickery used at the end of your shooting phase, up to two mounted units or one infantry unit, not with an engagement range, can move after they have shot and make a, a normal move of up to six inches, they can then not declare charges. So for example, you could, if you have those two bike units, right? So two, two units of three bikes on turn one, you move your, uh, Wraith Lord onto some objective and, and screen out your, your backfield from, uh, enemy nonsense. And then you pop out with both bike units and they move 14 inches. So they're pretty quick. You get a, you get an angle on your opponent, you get a bead. And between those two units, you light your opponent up with 20 anti-infantry shots. Maybe you kill an infantry unit that would be a real threat to the guardians. And then you use Zephyr Swift to move both units of bikes out of line of sight so that on your opponent's turn, they can see nothing except for the Wraith Lord, which you have put fortune on and is therefore incredibly hard to kill. Uh, in, the, in the latter part of the game, if you're not doing the Overwatch trick with the Guardians, if you're doing the other thing, you can have your Guardians step through a wall from your backfield because uh, terrain is breachable. So that means that uh, infantry models can just move straight through it. So even if it's a solid wall, people who are not accustomed to playing 40k are often surprised by this. You have your, your Guardians step through some... Uh, obscuring ruin so that they can see the midfield the whole unit including the the platform and the farseer blast something and then they use zephyr swift to step back through the wall and just be invisible to the opponent and this is this is how you get uh an advantage on your opponent i mentioned before you want to keep your head down until the opponent is weak enough that you can afford to take risks and this is how that works uh and the first two turns of the game you you use Zephyr Swift to, to do some serious damage with the bikes and or maybe the guardians. Then maybe you pop out and, and you roll, the, the final stroke is that Overwatch trick if you're using that stratagem or that enhancement, excuse me. And then once you've made the world safe for elves again, uh, you can storm the midfield and score. So the, the, big, the big principle is this. When you're thinking about scoring, just understand that as a space elf player, you're going to do most of your primary objective scoring in the second half of the game. Turn two, especially, is not a big primary objective scoring game, uh, scoring turn for you. It isn't because you, you need to you need to kill your opponent's models first. You need to pick up a bunch of models first. So if you want to lose, this is how you lose Combat Patrol 40k. You think to yourself on turn one, ah, this game is all about victory points. I know how to play games that are all about victory points. I will not fall into the trap as a new player of thinking that I must overemphasize killing my opponent's models. I will claim every objective. And so you zip out with one squad of bikes here and another squad of bikes there, and you run out with the Wraith Lord, and you think you're clever because the Wraith Lord's already tough, and you put fortune on one squad of bikes, and you use uh, whip fast reactions on the other one, and you're like, ha-ha, I have durability bonuses on both bike squads, and I have two objectives, and the Wraith Lord is already tough. 
come at me, bro. And then your opponent will come at you and will kill all your bikes. And then you will lose the game. Don't do that. Instead, be a smart elf. Keep your head down. Thin out your opponent's unit units using Zephyr Swift. If you exp expose anything to fire, it's the Wraith Lord. Unless you're dumping every possible conceivable buff on the Guardians and you, you, and you see that your opponent doesn't have anything that will still be able to kill them and using your Overwatch fire... Uh, and this is and this is how you and this is how you get on. And in the last three turns of the game, you that is when you try to pick up real primary points, especially on the last two. You want to you want your you probably your opponent will outscore you on primaries on turn two, and you want to outscore your opponent on primaries on turns four and five. Which brings us to the very last thing, and that is secondary objectives. So you can choose between two secondary uh, missions as a as a space elf player. One of them gives you 10 points at the end of the game if at the end of the game you have a unit wholly within your opponent's deployment zone. Um, that's good. 10 points is good. That's the same thing as having twice scored a primary objective during the game. If your opponent was one primary objective ahead of you, you could, uh, and, you, and you do this, you, you could win. But keep in mind that probably at the end of the game, neither of you is going to have a ton of models left. Usually that's how these combat patrol games go. Maybe you can march your, uh, your Wraith Lord into your opponent's backfield. One advantage to choosing this one is that it forces your opponent to deal with the Wraith Lord uh, because your opponent can get to your opponent's backfield for sure. So if you take this objective and your opponent decides that they're just going to ignore the Wraith Lord, they're giving up 10 victory points at the end of the game. Uh, also, the bikes are really quick. And not only do they move 14 and make an and, and then theoretically could advance and you could use a you could use a fate die if you needed to to just pop them into the backfield on one of those units into the backfield on turn five pretty reliably and pick up some points. Uh, that's a solid option. I will say that you are very likely, though, not to have any bikes left at the end of the game. They they kind of are your tradey disposable units, and so choosing this one limits what you can do. The Guardians are very unlikely to get there, as is the Farseer. So either you've got to be planning to keep one bike unit alive and zip it in on turn five, which limits your ability to expose it to fire, or you're going to do the long march with the Wraith Lord, and your opponent might be able to kill it. Uh, the 10-point thing is great. I think it can be a bit swingy because it's it's either it's it's an all or nothing one. Your other option is to take a, a secondary objective that gives you three points every time you take an objective uh, that you didn't control at the beginning of your turn, or, or if you, you, three points if you do it at least once. I like this one because unless you totally get your butt kicked, in which case you weren't going to win anyway, you cannot fail to score less than six with it. And if you're doing if you're doing well enough that you could finish with a unit in your opponent's backfield, you probably can get to nine with it. Maybe even 12. Maybe even 12. And if you're getting to six points, if you think about it uh, in terms of primary objectives, if your opponent was one primary objective ahead of you and you score 10 points, you win the game. If your opponent was one primary objective ahead of you and you score six points, you win the game. Uh, so th this one is automatically going to get you that edge. The the only place where it might be a little bit weird is you also have to take into, into account your opponent's secondary scoring. And ideally, you want to play to prevent your opponent from scoring secondaries. If you score six and your opponent scores six, it's a wash. And that's probably likely to happen in a lot of games. It's pretty easy to score six. If you score six and your opponent scores 10, well, as long as you are one primary objective ahead Anyway, you still win. And so I kind of like this one better. I don't think there's anything wrong with the behind enemy lines option. I just think that it's more likely that behind enemy lines will score you the points in games that you were going to win anyway. And occasionally there will be games where you get nothing for it and you would have gotten six and now you lose. So while it's not bad, I do don't actually think it's the it's the stronger pick, even though intuitively it might seem like uh, space elves are fast. That's ten easy points. So so my vote is the is the three points per objective.
So that's what I've got. I think uh, there are fundamentally two different ways to play this uh, combat patrol. One is t to build everything around that overwatch power with the guardians. The other is that I think the more standard, slightly more straightforward, maybe uh, less elf trickery way of just keeping your head down, only going out with the Wraith Lord, Zephyr swifting the, uh, the bikes, and then making a, a big push in the late game when you've got when you've got the the advantage and and that's how you do it and what i what i especially like about this is the, the skills that you will develop doing this are the same skills that will serve you well when you start playing aldari and the main warhammer 40,000 game because they overall they play the same way and that's pretty cool okay so if you liked this video i hope that you will click like if you have not yet subscribed i hope that you will subscribe i am creeping up on 10,000 subscribers and i would love to get there and when i do i'll come up with some cool thing to do. I don't know. It'll be cool. If you'd like to obtain early access to content and talk to uh, other super cool elf players on my discord, you could become a patron. It's the, the lowest patron level is only uh, three bucks a month. I hugely appreciate my patrons. And frankly, I think they are the reason that I'm still doing this uh, a couple of years in. So I'd love to see you uh, join that community uh, because it's Enorm enormously enjoyable for me to see the conversations on discord and and also informative there are players of all different levels and also obviously i appreciate the practical support okay that's what i've got thanks everybody i'll be back soon with new content until then best of luck with your pointy ears